Well, good morning. So good to see everybody. Well, I was a junior in college in Eau Claire. I had uh, taken a year and a half off to pursue some music stuff that I wanted to do, and then I was coming back to Eau Claire to finish up my degree. And I was making my way back into some old friend groups, and I was also making some new friends. And I made one really important connection at that time in my life, and it was this guy, Russ. I think he's on the right there. That's Russ. I've talked about him once in a sermon before, but Russ was this really important guy in my life at the, at the time. He owned a small coffee shop. He was a pastor at, um, that actually ran a small church of about a dozen people that would meet in the coffee shop. Um, he's currently a pastor at a church in Eau Claire. But one of uh, Russ's favorite things to do is just to walk alongside college kids, especially college guys, as they're trying to figure out what's going on in their lives. I know we have a couple people here this morning who do that work with uh, college students, and it's really important work because it's one of those times in your life where you just have a lot of questions and, and your life is not fully figured out. It's a really messy time of your life. And I remember Russ was important in my life for a number of reasons, but one of the main reasons why he was important is because he provided a safe place for me and my friends once a week to get together to meet just in this back room of the coffee shop and to talk about our weeks. We would read scripture together. We'd talk about where things were good. We'd talk about where things weren't good in the week um, and where we had difficulties. But more than that, in this group of guys who were like 20 years younger than Russ, he created an environment where there were no off-limit questions. There, every single question you could ask when you'd meet with him was, was totally fine. You weren't going to get excommunicated for any of the questions that you asked. Uh, you could ask anything. You could be eloquent about it or, or not. And the guys in the group, like a lot of college guys, we just had messy lives. And so we would bring our messy lives. It was the first time I remember just feeling like I could share anything with these people. And it would be totally fine. It was a safe place to be heard, but there would be a resonance with these guys as well. And not only that, but the best part about it is that a lot of these guys, these were my personal friends. So I'd, I lived with a couple of them. We hung out throughout the week. And so we'd do life together. And we'd come back once a week and we'd talk with Russ. And you just start to see like slow, extremely slow growth over the course of one or two years as you start to do this stuff. And I remember one particular question that I brought to the group one week. Um, I was a religious studies major in college, but I spent a lot of time thinking about ancient Judaism, like the Jewish faith, especially in the first century, so the time around Jesus. And I remember watching a YouTube video that came across one night. It was about Jewish life in the first century, and it was this particular video that was meant for Christians like me for young Christians like me, because it was about how Jesus was not the only Messiah who ever lived in ancient Israel, but he was one of dozens of so-called Messiahs, and he wasn't even the first of the Messiahs. So it was one of these types of videos that's supposed to kind of take down your faith, kind of be like, ha, gotcha, you didn't see that coming. And it was presented in a way where I can remember having one of those sinking in the bottom of my stomach, in the pit of my stomach feeling. Have you had that feeling before? Where it's like nobody had ever told me any of this information before in church. And so I remember getting done watching the video, and I had this decision that I had to make all of a sudden. It, it, the first thing I could do is I could just ignore the information. I could pretend like I'd never heard it. I, I'd try to rewind and just pretend like it never happened. I never saw the video or I could do what so many people uh, in my generation did at that time. Is they came across information like this, and they just throw your hands up and say, See, Jesus isn't who he said he was, and I might as well get on with my life and leave Christianity, this Christianity thing to simple-minded people. And I remember having that feeling like, have I just been lied to my whole life? But by the grace of God, I, I didn't do anything rash. I went to bed, and I woke up the next morning, and I went and I talked with Russ. I talked with him, and I talked with him, and I told him what I had learned, and instead of doubling down or telling me to repent and to figure out why Jesus is actually true and why the information is wrong, he did something very different. He just sat, and he nodded, and he listened, and he was totally unfazed. It's like the information I was telling him didn't bother him at all. He was just like, yep, 
okay? He wasn't shocked. He wasn't offended. He wasn't even surprised. He just invited me to keep journeying with him and to keep following Jesus with him. And we'll find out later if I would ever get an answer to my questions. That was the kind of posture that Russ had. And I wonder if you've ever had a really difficult question like the one that I brought to Russ about new information that you found out and, and you had that unsettled and difficult feeling. And I wonder if you've ever learned something that's just a shock to your system like that. And, and it might even undermine your whole worldview and you just have that sinking feeling inside. Or I wonder if you've ever been confronted with new information and you have that sinking feeling and you're not sure how you're going to be able to get back to life the way that it used to be. And how did that feel? How does that feel? How does that feel when the simplicity of your life is like swept out from underneath you and you're left in a world that seems very strange and very foreign and it's in moments like these that sometimes the best tool that we have is a good question to a good friend of ours, someone who will listen, who will stick with you to the end, someone who won't give you just the pat answer but will allow you the space to journey with God. Because I think sometimes we assume that if Jesus were physically a person right here next to me, that all of my questions would be answered. But I got news for you. In the Gospels, he doesn't answer everybody's questions the way that they like. It's not like they've got it all figured out because they're next to Jesus and they can ask him anything. In fact, sometimes they walk away scratching their head and trying to figure out who he is and what he's up to because he oftentimes answers their questions in a way that they were not expecting. And that's exactly what's going on in the book of John. So you can open your Bibles to John chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 25, but just to kind of catch us up from last week. Uh, last week we heard Brian speak about the first half of chapter 7, which happens in Jerusalem in the Festival of Tabernacles. The Festival of Tabernacles is the most popular Jewish festival. Everyone loves the Festival of Tabernacles because it happens in the fall. It's like a harvest fest type feel. So you're like bringing in all of your, uh, the harvest for the year. Um, and so everybody loves it. It's a festival to celebrate and commemorate what God did in bringing his people out of the land of Egypt. So they're remembering all of these things. They had to make these temporary living spaces in the desert. And so that's what this festival of tabernacles is all about. And it's a festival about prayer for the harvest, but remembrance of Jesus. And it's also about a festival where Jesus comes down secretly this year. So if you'll remember from last week, what Brian was talking about is that his brothers were kind of putting it in front of him. Like, are you going to come down to the f festival and present yourself Jesus says that he's not going to do it, but then he does it. And when he gets there, they start peppering him with questions about who he is. And now we pick up with the rest of the dialogue, starting in verse 25. I'm going to do something a little different because this is a little bit of a different text that we're reading this morning. I'm just going to read the text. It's going to take a couple of minutes, but it's a whole scene like you would see in a movie or something like that. So just imagine this scene happening, starting in verse 25. It says this, it says, at that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man that they are trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly, and they're not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Messiah? But we know where he, this man is from, and when the Messiah comes, no one will know where he's from. And then Jesus, still speaking in the temple courts, cried out, yes, you know me, and you know where I'm from. And I'm not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true, and you do not know him, but I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. At this they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Still many in the crowd believed in him, and they said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? And the, the Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. And then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to try to arrest Jesus. And Jesus said, I am with you only for a short time, and then I'm going to the one who sent me. You'll look for me, but you will not be able to find me. And where I am going, you cannot come. So then the Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go where we cannot find him? Will he go to our people live living scattered amongst the Greeks and teach the Greeks? 
What did he mean when he said, you will look for me, but you will not find me? And where I am, you cannot come. Now catch this. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and in a loud voice said, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. And up to that point, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. And on hearing these words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said, He is the Messiah. Still others asked, How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not Scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and be from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? And thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but nobody laid a hand on him. And finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, Why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. You mean he's deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. But Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? And they replied, what, are you from Galilee too? Look into it. You'll find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. So thanks for sticking with that kind of long reading of Scripture. I hope you understand why I read it, because so many things happen with so many different types of people. It's a long scene, but I think it's an important scene because it shows us this very real dynamic of how people were trying to grapple with who Jesus was And is he true? Is he true? And what would it mean for my life if this man is true? What he's saying is true. And the first group of people that we see grappling with who Jesus was, was the crowd. It's the crowd. It's these Jewish people who are there for the festival. And now crowds in their day are much like crowds in our day. If you keep up with any kind of news, we see crowds of people who gather all the time. And crowds are notoriously fickle. Right? Crowds, crowds really have a hard time grappling with nuance, and you see the crowd here actually having a difficult time figuring it out what it is they believe about Jesus. Because earlier in the chapter, it says that uh, Jesus says that the Jews are trying to kill him, and, the, and they say, you're crazy. You're demon-possessed. But here, later in the chapter, you know what they say? They say, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? So you can already figure out that the crowd doesn't know which one to believe. They're like, no one's trying to kill you, Jesus. And then later in the chapter, they're like, wait a minute, isn't this the guy they're trying to kill? And you can kind of see how there's a lack of rationality happening here within the crowd. There's a lot of opinions. They're trying to figure out who this man is because the authorities wanted to kill him. But here he is. He's speaking publicly. And they're like, well, maybe the authorities think that this guy is the Messiah if they're letting him speak. And it's a complicated issue they're trying to figure out because on the one hand, his teaching, it's so good. They're so compelled by his teaching, by his healing. How can you deny the fact that these people are being healed? And yet on the other hand, they doubt him because he doesn't check all of their messianic boxes. It actually reminds me of an old friend of mine from way back in the day when I was a kid. His name was Anthony. He grew up in the city, but he ended up living out in Brookfield. And he started playing soccer at age 15, which is very odd for most people. Uh, Most people in Brookfield start playing soccer at age five or six. And so Anthony uh, picked it up in high school And I remember a lot of people having the same types of issues and problems with him, just wrapping their mind around this kid who's playing soccer, but he doesn't look like he should be playing soccer. I mean, he's like just started playing, right? And he's playing with all these other high schoolers. So he'd get the ball, and the ball would go like 20 feet away from him immediately. He just had a terrible touch. He just couldn't couldn't keep the, the ball at all. He'd lose possession of the ball. He was extremely rough around the edges on the field. He was just kind of all over the place. But one thing that he had is he was faster than anybody who would step on the field by a mile. I mean, this was the fastest person I've ever stepped on a soccer field with. He was so incredibly fast. And so I remember him making the varsity team 
as a junior after playing for one year. He made the varsity team as the 22nd out of 22 players, as the very last person made. He beat out a bunch of kids who had been playing their entire life, which made them really, really upset that this kid who just started playing got picked to be on the varsity team. But I remember our coach picked him because he was this kind of wild card that you could play. Like if you were tied and there was five minutes left in the game, you throw Anthony in there and just see what could happen. Just like let's play a long ball and see he'll sprint past everybody and maybe, just maybe the ball might go, go into the goal. And so the way that he played was unconventional and it made people take a second look. They'd be like, who is that kid with that kind of speed? They had never seen somebody with that kind of speed before because he was getting the job done in, in a way that was totally unexpected, but it was actually pretty effective. You couldn't have called him a really good player, but he had something really, really incredible. You just couldn't deny. And I think Jesus is making people also take a second look at him because he's not checking all of their messianic boxes that they have, but, and, but people are looking and they're like, well, when the Messiah comes, is he going to be better than this guy? Really? Is that what's going to happen? Because there was a common understanding in Jesus' day that the Messiah would be this mysterious person sent by God who just shows up all of a sudden, out of nowhere. And Jesus, Jesus, on the other hand, was totally normal. People knew exactly where he was from. People knew his family. He had brothers. He might have even had sisters. He, he had people that knew him his whole entire life. He was normal. And so he was doing and teaching and saying a lot of great things, but he wasn't checking all the boxes. And you had to admit, it was a bit complicated to try to figure him out if you're just an average, everyday person. And Jesus, what adds to this complication is the fact that Jesus challenges their way of relating to God. He challenges their understanding of God. In verse 28, when he's talking about God, listen to this if you're a Jewish person who knows God. He says, you don't know him. You don't know him, but I know him because I am from him and he sent me. Now, now think about that. Here they were. They're participating in this festival. They had been participating in their whole entire life. This festival given to them by God. They live their whole lives in reference to God. They pray every single day to God. They have these daily prayers. They have these rituals. They have fasting. Everything they do, the stories they tell around the campfire, it's all about God and what he's done and, and how he provided for them. And yet Jesus says, it actually makes sense that you can't figure out who I am because you don't even know God. And just think about that language. It's provocative. It's like in-your-face kind of language about God. It's the kind of language that would get you killed, to be frank. And that's exactly what we see in verse 30. It says that they tried to seize him. They're like, that's enough. We've had enough. And yet, there's many, even after him saying that, there's many in the crowd who still believe in him. And I hope you get this sense now as we read through this passage that for the everyday person in the crowd, it's really, really, really complicated to try to figure out what you think of this guy. And yet, while one way to respond is to feel as if Jesus is complicated, the guards show us what it looks like to feel really conflicted over Jesus. You see, the guards were ordered to arrest Jesus. The religious leaders had had enough, and the temple guards needed to take care of a problem by putting an end to Jesus' public ministry. And the guards did something very strange, though, because they actually risked their livelihood, possibly even their lives, by willingly choosing to disobey orders, which should cause us to stop and just pause and ask the question, why would they do that? It's such a huge risk. They didn't bring back Jesus. And again, I think that the guards are actually one of the most helpful people in this passage to me, because I really don't think the guards had a horse in the messianic race. I, I don't think they had like a huge opinion on Jesus, on this guy is the Messiah or he's not the Messiah. I think they were temple guards and they were there to do something that they were ordered to do. And I love that. I absolutely love that because sometimes I think I grew up in church my whole life and I've heard all these stories about Jesus and so I might have a little bit of a bias. But here are these temple guards who I really don't think have any bias whatsoever. 
They're just totally neutral observers. I don't think they have a horse in the race, and it, and it gives us this window in mu- what it must have been like for a person who's unbiased to hear Jesus. And what did they say? They said, no one ever spoke the way that this guy spoke. We've never heard anything like this. And it took something powerful for them to say, we can't arrest this guy. And it shows us what that unbiased judgment of Jesus looks like. It's not unlike Pontius Pilate later on, who hears Jesus' testimony and says, I'm not going to kill the guy. If you want to kill him, you can kill him, but I, I'm not, it's not going to be on my hands. And I think in our world, in our time, there's so many misguided ideas and objections to Jesus that some people, when they finally stop listening to other people's opinions and actually read the Gospels themselves, they experience a very similar thing about Jesus. I think they experience a very similar reality. They feel compelled. They feel convicted. But they also feel conflicted. Because they realize that they live in a world and they live in a culture that in many ways hates this man. But if they're honest, they don't know why other people see him this way. And so they live in this place of feeling conflicted about Jesus. And so that's a second way that we can come at Jesus, is just feeling conflicted, like we're torn in two different directions. And a third way that people come and responded to Jesus in this passage, it's the religious leaders themselves. The religious leaders feel cornered. I I, I imagine almost like an animal, like a wild animal that's in a corner. The religious leaders um, are feeling cornered because it's like other modes of work. When a new technology comes by, I don't know if any of you have one of those houses that has like the milk slot where the milkman would put the milk inside of? I don't know if anyone does, but maybe oh, a couple of you do. Like, that's old technology. Milk hasn't been delivered that way for I don't know how many years, and, and that's just one small example. But when we're in a field and a new technology comes around, um, it can take away our sense of security if, if it's threatening our job. And I think that the religious leaders are feeling that sense of being threatened here by Jesus because he's actually living the thing that they've always wanted to see, but it's threatening their livelihood. And the religious leaders represented this important way of life for the Jewish people. I mean, they ran the synagogues. They played this important role in the political world of their day. And here, during this most important festival, they were the ones carrying out all of the ceremonies, uh, which happened every day. They they had this ritual that happened uh, once a day for six days. The priests would walk to the Gihon Spring, which flowed into the Pool of Siloam, which we've read about in other places in the Gospels, and the priest would take this golden pitcher and a choir and all the people would would join the priest as they walked down to the end and they'd be singing Isaiah 12, 3, which says, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. So they're singing. You imagine all these people singing this, this celebration that's happening and the priests are dipping the water and the people uh, have palms on one side of the street um, there's harvest palms, and on the other side of the street, there's desert palms. And so it's, it's all symbolism. It's all to remind you of what God has done and what he's doing. And then they would shake the palms as the priests are going down to the water, and they'd sing Psalms 113 through 118. It's this whole procession that happened. And the priests would take the water back up to the altar in the pitcher, And they would go to the altar of the temple while the crowd was waving their palm branches and continuing to sing. And it was an important symbol and a reminder of what God had done for the people of Israel. And this is the symbol. This is what the religious leaders are doing. And they would take the water and they'd pour it out over the rock of the temple, of the altar, and it would flow out from the rock. And it would remind them of how God provided water out of a rock in the middle of a desert. What incredible symbolism and remembering what God had done and bringing them out of Egypt. But not only that, it had one more meaning, and that's because there were these visions from the Old Testament, from Zechariah and Ezekiel, visions where they said not only did God pour out water from the rock once, but there will be a day when water will flow from the altar in the temple and it will go all the way to the Dead Sea and the, the vision that they had, that the prophets had, was of all of this life growing from the river and that it would actually make the Dead Sea fresh water again. It was a symbol of God renewing creation one day 
once and for all. Wow. That's what the religious leaders were doing. This is the image that the Jewish people imagined as they came to the festival for the festival of tabernacles. And the religious leaders would do this once a day for six days, but on the greatest day, on the seventh day, they would do the religious practice seven times. They would do that whole thing seven times. And now imagine being a religious leader and doing this day in and day out. Year after year after year, you do the same performance. But on this particular year, on the seventh day of the festival, this unknown, unordained, unapproved man from Galilee of all places says these words on the seventh day. He says, let anyone who is thirsty go to the altar in the temple. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. How would you respond if you were a religious leader? They felt cornered. That's intense. How did they respond? They responded as if Jesus was a threat. How would you respond if your whole livelihood, your whole way of doing life, your whole way of relating to God was threatened in they, that moment? Well, they used every resource that they had to disprove him, to discredit him, and to distract people from this man. They said things like, he's not ordained. He's from Galilee. He's deceived everyone. And ultimately, they responded how a cornered animal would with their teeth flared, ready to attack, to save their lives. And for some of us, too, that, that's our story. That might have been your story at one point in time where you're so far from God, and God was like hunting you down. And when he finally got a hold of you, you, you couldn't run anymore. You couldn't run anymore because you were just too scared and you just had to give in to God ultimately. But there's a fourth way that people responded to him. There's one man who responded in this way. It's, it's shown to us by perhaps the least likely of people, and it's Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, I love Nicodemus, because Nicodemus is just curious in the, in the Gospel of John. Uh, now, re remember, Nicodemus was this Pharisee who took this great risk by coming to Jesus at night in chapter 3 of John. And he's curious about Jesus. He's asking all these questions about Jesus. And it's those right kinds of questions that led him to a place where he's now able to defend Jesus in this moment. Because Nicodemus knew that Jesus was not a bad person. He, it even says in John 3, he says, I know that you're from God. He knew that he was from God. He knew that the words that he spoke and the things that he did showed that he was from God. And because he had asked the hard questions previously, he was settled now in his own thinking about who Jesus was. He was able to see the nonsense of his fellow religious leaders, the, just the nonsense that was happening, how they used bad information to try to discredit Jesus. My favorite is where they say, just look into it. There's no, there's no prophets that come from Galilee. And the, the fact of the matter is both Jonah and Hosea were widely known as being from Galilee. They're just engaging in nonsense to try to discredit this man. And so it was Nicodemus' curiosity about Jesus that allowed him to keep a kind of grounded mind and a grounded heart, and he desperately wanted God to act now. Not just remember what God did in the past, but come and do something right now. That's what he wanted. He saw the difference between a religious ritual which remembered to what he did in the past. He just wanted it to happen now. And so each of us might find ourselves in one of these four places uh, right now or at some point in our life. You might be able to remember what it was like to be in one of these places, um, to feel like your relationship with God is either complicated, it's just a complicated relationship right now, or, or to feel conflicted about him, or to feel cornered. Like, like there's way too much to lose if you were to, to follow God or, or to feel curious about God, open, wondering what God was going to do in your life right now. But it's with all of these kinds of people all around Jesus, surrounding him in one moment, that Jesus highlights just how different he is because Jesus, in the midst of it all, 
is completely unfazed. He's totally unfazed in the midst of it all. He's completely secure in who he is. He's completely grounded in who God is. He's grounded. He's unfazed and he's grounded because of who approved him. Earlier in the text, it says, he says, I'm not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. He knew who had already ordained him and approved him and appointed him and sent him on mission. And so he was totally unfazed by what these people thought. He was unfazed and grounded because of who had sent him. He said, I'm with you just for a short time and then I'm going to the one who sent me. He knew his time was short, so he was unfazed by these people. He was unfazed and grounded because of what reality is. He looked at what true reality is. He said, listen, anyone who's thirsty can come to me and find what they are looking for. Rivers of life flowing from God himself will flow out of these people. You see, Jesus was unfazed because of the pattern of his life, because he was intentional with his father. Did you know that he was the only person who called God Father in those days? It was one of the reasons why they wanted to kill him. Because he would actually use a term, Abba. He'd call God Daddy. He knew the Father with an intimacy that no one else knew. It was his favorite term for his Father. The religious leaders and the common Israelites had all kinds of names for God, but no one would call God Abba. It was something they had never seen before. And and that's what this whole temple thing is about. The temple is about relationship where God is. And Jesus is himself showing us what it looks like to be in relationship with God. The temple was the place where God's presence touched down to earth. And Jesus was showing, he was acting in a way where he's saying, this is what it looks like now in a human life for God's presence to come and touch down And that's the point of why Jesus said what he said. He said that people who believe in me will become the kind of place where heaven and earth overlap. You'll become a walking kind of temple. You won't need to go to the tabernacle anymore to do the religious ritual. Not that there's anything wrong with the ritual, but you'll find that your life, you'll carry the tabernacle with you and the life of God will flow from you. And Jesus has the audacity to say that if you believe in me, if you simply believe, if you have, if you put your trust and allegiance in him, that if you believe in him, you'll see that your life becomes the place where the Spirit of God flows out. And people who are living in a desert around you, when they see it, when they feel it, the presence of God's Spirit in your life, they'll go, You've got something, and I didn't even realize I was thirsty until I saw what you had. And they're going to want that. They're going to want what it is you have because your life becomes this oasis place for God's spirit. And how will you know that you're experiencing God's spirit, experiencing the real Jesus? Well, I would say that you'll know the river will flow out of you. You want something less abstract than that? Something less abstract you'll know that you are living life by the Spirit because you'll start to describe your own experience of life by the two words that highlighted Jesus' life. That you're unfazed and you're grounded. How are you doing, Nate? I'm unfazed. (laughs) I'm grounded. It's a weird way to respond when people ask, how are you doing? But it's it's the way that Jesus' life was characterized It's what happens when the Spirit starts to come and live in you is that all of the craziness of the world around you, it's not that there aren't important things, but they all become less in reference to who God is. And all of a sudden, wherever you're coming from in life, whether you're feeling cornered, you're feeling conflicted, you're feeling like life is complicated, that God is complicated, you'll find that even if you had all the answers to all of your questions, it wouldn't give you what you ultimately want. Because what you want is him. And you don't need all the answers to find what you're looking for. That's what Jesus shows us. You don't need all the answers. He didn't answer all of their questions. You don't need all of the answers to find what you're looking for. And so go back to my friend Russ. Russ knew something at the time that I didn't know. Uh, Russ knew the answer to my questions about the Messiah thing. He knew the answer. 
Uh, he, the, it really rattled me, but it didn't rattle him at all. He, he discovered and experienced uh, the same reason why Jesus spoke in parables is because sometimes the answers that we're looking for aren't necessarily found by getting new information. He knew that if he just gave me the information that I wanted to hear, it wouldn't answer all of my questions that I was looking for. And yet what he did instead is he invited me into a relationship and he said, just come and keep walking with me and we'll see what God does in your life. And what I found is that it started to heal my anxiety and my doubts and uh, it was a solution for so many of the broken parts of me was just to keep walking with Jesus and being with him and, and to live in that place where his life could flow out of me. And my questions, I still have tons of questions. I still have so many questions that are unanswered. But I find that when I walk with him, and literally I mean walk with him, I go on walks with God and I talk with him. I bring up things that anger me and frustrate me, and those questions start to just become small in his presence. And I find that my life is starting to be characterized by, I would say, being grounded and unfazed. And Jesus invited his followers to do that. Jesus invites you this morning to do that as well. And so I'm going to pray for us um, that we would experience that presence in our lives. Let's pray. God, we love you, and you invite us into something that is new and fresh. God, you did so many amazing things 3,000 years ago and 2,000 years ago, and you've done so many amazing things through the church over the centuries. God, you've done so many amazing things in each of our lives, and we want to say thank you. But we know that you are just flowing uh, with life that's healing for the world right now in this very moment. Uh, we know that you want to do something in our lives right now. And so, God, I pray that you would do that, that you'd open up our eyes. God, wherever we come from this morning, whether we're feeling conflicted or concerned or feeling like we just have too much to lose in following you, God, I pray that you'd bring to mind things that are in the way of this relationship that so often get in the way. Pray that you'd just help us to set those things aside. Help us to set aside time where we can give you in these things, where we can offer you these things, Lord. And we want to make space in our life for your spirit. So give us a creativity, Lord. Give us a creativity to just create space in our life where you can exist. Because we want more of you. We love you so much. We are expectant for what you're going to do in our lives. We pray those things in Jesus' name. Amen.